Greetings and welcome to another lecture in statistics. Now I'm going to warn you that this chapter is one of those conceptual chapters. There's going to be quite a bit to think about, but there's not really going to be any math here. Uh, the math all comes in the next chapter, chapter 10, and trust me, you will be running into math there. It should satisfy all your math cravings and more. But this is more of a thought chapter to get you to think about and understand how things relate to one another. Uh, I didn't name it. It sounds like a science fiction movie, but at any rate, beyond the null hypothesis. So when we're talking about hypotheses, and actually I covered some of this back when we first started talking about the null hypothesis versus the alternative hypothesis, is generally we have what's called the null hypothesis, which as you know means that there is no difference, and then we have what's called the alternative hypothesis, which is also called the research hypothesis, which is indeed there is a difference. Now it is possible to have multiple alternate hypotheses. And in fact, it's very common to have multiple alternate hypotheses. Uh, for instance, a lot of what we were working on earlier was that the null hypothesis is equal to something. Not less than or equal or more than equal, but equal to something. Okay? Now, if we have the null hypothesis is that the population mu, population uh, mean mu is equal to something, then the alternative could be that the actual uh, score set that you have is has a mean that is higher, has a mean that is lower, or has a mean that could be either, that you don't know. So you might go in thinking, for instance, well, I'm doing a test of medication, and the medication should make the symptoms less likely to occur, and therefore the mean will be lower. Or you might say, well, this medication is going to make uh, people have more behavior, and therefore it's going to be higher. Or it could be, we don't know what this is going to do, but it's going to do something. Now, depending on what you kind of are going with in your particular alternative hypothesis, they have different names. If you think that the uh, sample mean is going to be higher or you think that the sample mean is going to be lower, these are called directional. Notice the or there. It's going to be higher. I think it's going to be higher. Or I think it's going to be lower. It's not I think it's going to be higher or lower. That's that's not how it works. It needs to be one or the other. Okay? It's either I believe it's going to be higher or I believe it's going to be lower. And these are generally used when researchers have a really good reason to think it is either going to be higher or going to be lower. Uh, the problem is that if you're looking at it and you say, I think it's going to be higher, and you actually use statistics to test that, it's not going to tell you whether the, the actual sample mean is lower. It's only going to look for higher. So if it turns out that your idea is completely wrong and everything is lower, it's not going to tell you that. And that's a problem with these directional hypotheses. Now, the other option are the non-directional hypothesis, which is that the alternate, the alternate uh, hypothesis is the mean is going to be, sample mean is going to be one or the other. We don't know what. It's going to do something, but we don't know what it's going to be. And quite frankly, generally, this is what researchers use. Because you may have the absolute best intentions and think, yes, of course, it's going to make it better, but in fact, it might make it worse or vice versa. You don't really know. And so it's much better to use the non-directional because then the statistics that you use will look for both. It's also a little bit more rigorous of a test, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Actually, we'll talk about that kind of now. Now, I'm going to show you diagrams on the next two pages. They come from your textbook, so you don't really need to try to reproduce them in your notes. Um, when we're talking about a two-tailed test, okay, we're talking about a two-tailed test, you could basically find, I know that was kind of weird, I apologize, you could basically find a change at either end. You're looking for a difference in either end. So remember if we've got a, our alpha is 0.05, if you're looking at the Z test or the T test, you divide that in half. 
So instead of looking up 0.05, you look up 0.025 because we're going with it could be either at the high end or at the low end. It's still 5% of the total area, but that's basically why we divide that in half. Because of the 5%, 2.5 is at the top and 2.5 is at the bottom. So notice that those critical values are larger. They're further along than it would be just if it was 5% on one end or the other, which is what we have here. Where the entire critical area is either at one end or it's at the other end. It's not possible at both ends. So if you compare this to the slide before, we'll do that real fast. Notice where that line is. Notice that line is somewhere around 1.75 units away from the mean. But when we go to this one, it's a lot closer to two. So in fact, when you have a two-tailed, when you have a non-directional, the critical value is larger than if you have a one-tailed. Because with a two-tailed, you're dividing the 0.05 or the 0.01 or the point whatever it is in half and looking at both ends. Well, with a one-tail, you're only looking at one end. So the critical value is going to be a little smaller. And you could actually see this if you look at the t-table chart from the last test or if you, if you uh, look at the t-table chart even from your textbook. And you'll notice that there's a difference between the one-tailed and the two-tailed readings. For the same degree of freedom, the critical value changes. So the critical value for a two-tailed test, when you're looking at either extreme, is going to be larger than the critical value when you're only looking at one extreme, when you're looking at the one end and not both. So the critical value is lower. So it's easier to jump that hurdle. It's easier for you to find a, a test statistic that basically allows you to find this to be significant, which quite frankly is another reason why researchers like to use two-tailed. Because researchers want to make sure that what they're finding is actually significant, is actually rare enough that you can say that it's real, that it's not something that was created. Okay, it's not something that's just chance. It's real. And so therefore they go for the two-tailed for a little bit of added rigor, for a little bit of a higher hurdle to jump. And also that way they cover themselves if it turns out that what they think will happen is not actually what happens. So with the t-table, it's easy. You basically look for, you know, the degree of freedom, and then you look at the top, and it tells you whether it's a one-tailed or a two-tailed test. With the z-test, it's a little different, although, again, it should, it should make sense because before, when we were looking at 0.05, we split the percentage in two. That threw a lot of people off on the test, is we split it into two. So it's 0.025 instead of 0.05. Or if we were looking at a 0.01, we would be looking at 0 0.005 plus or minus instead of 0 0.01. Well, with a one-tailed test, if you're looking at, if your alpha is 0 0.05, you look for 0 0.05, which basically means if you look at your z-test that the alpha, the, the, the critical z value there when you have a 0.05 test, is plus or minus 1.645, not plus or minus 1.960. Plus or minus 1.960 is when you're looking at 0.025, when you have a non-directional test, when you're looking at either end. Plus or minus 1.645 is when you have a directional, and you're only looking at one. So very much like the t-test, very much like what we saw before, it's a lower bar to jump. It's a little easier to get that calculated z t -t statistics that will run into or actually be more extreme than this particular uh, bar. So much of the first part of the chapter is basically that. It's the difference between a one-tailed and a two-tailed in how you find whether or not your score is indeed extreme enough to be considered significant. 
much of the rest of the chapter deals with power and effect. Now what you might want to do first before we start talking about this is go back and review from your notes from chapter 7 when I spent quite some time in class actually talking about type 1 and type 2 errors to make sure that you really got the difference between the two. Okay, type 1 versus most of you did quite well in that on the test so hopefully you got that difference. Now power is the ability of a test to reject a false null hypothesis. Okay, power is when you want to be able to reject a false null. So you don't want to accept it when it's not true. And since the, uh, the chance of a uh, type 2 error is beta, power is essentially 1 minus beta. <laughs> And so that gives you the likelihood of rejecting a false null. So the smaller beta is, then basically the more power a test has. The problem, of course, is that the smaller beta is, uh, in a complicated, not very linear way, then the larger is the chance that you're going to reject a true null. So that can definitely be a problem, okay? Because as the chance of a type 2 goes down, then the chance of a type 1 kind of goes up. Okay, chance of a type 1 kind of goes up. So, what we're then we're talking about when we're talking about effect is we're talking about the change in a measurement that is attributable to a treatment condition or a stimulus. The effect is basically what it sounds like. Okay? It is the change in that sample mean that's attributable to some sort of treatment conditioning. In other words, it's not attributable to chance. It's attributable to something that you have actually done. And so it is, you can indeed think of the effect as being the... Uh, you know, it's the effect of the independent variable, the effect of the treatment position, whatever that might be. So the larger the effect, the more likely we would find a difference and reject the null. If you have a very subtle effect, if your treatment condition has a very, very subtle change, then it's possible that you're going to miss it, that you're not going to see it. Okay. And one of the ways, by the way, to deal with that is to have a larger sample size. Because the larger the sample size you have, the more likely it is that subtle effects are going to be noticeable. So you want to make sure that you have a large enough sample size without going crazy. I mean, if you get the sample size is much larger than about 1,000, first of all, you can kiss the idea of doing the math by hand goodbye, but also you need to realize that you know, it, it, it reaches a point where it essentially doesn't really work anymore. How to increase the power? As I said, increasing the sample size within reason. Go for a one-tailed test. Remember, one-tailed test, it, it basically makes it easier to find something that's significant, although it also then makes it more likely that that significant isn't actually significant because a one-tailed test is less rigorous. You can increase the level of significance, which can increase the chance of a type 1 error, which is basically, remember, a type 1 error is when you uh, basically reject a true alternate hypothesis. Or make sure you control research situations very, very highly. You want to make sure that you reduce any chance that you've got something that might mask the effect. Reduce anything that might mask that very, very subtle treatment effect that you might have. The more controlled you have, the more you control other variables, the more likely it is that you'll be able to see that very, very subtle effect. And that's basically Chapter 9. We got it in one video. So, 
Make sure that you go back and read and review the chapter and do the questions for homework, please.